Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to another investor briefing today. This week, we're inviting yet another special guest, Mr. Balram Baswani, founder of Kaya Group and chief financial officer of LL1, a publicly listed company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Mr. Baswani has worn many hats throughout his career. He has served as CEO of Marley Coffee Jamaica, managing director of RE Television, and he's also the founder of the JNN News Network. Mr. Vaswani, also as a, as a pioneer leading the research to legally cultivate and process cannabis plant here in Jamaica, an endeavor that made, was made possible thanks to one of two licenses issued by the government in 20, 2015. Today, Bali will be giving you an investor briefing on the Kyre Group, and I would like to welcome him to the investor series. Welcome, Bali. Dan, thanks for having me. Also online, I'd like to welcome our CEO, Gary Pear. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, Barbara. As well as our chairman, Mr. Christopher Berry. Welcome, Chris. Good night, everyone. Thanks for all being with us. Good Bali, evening, thanks guys. for being with us. Let's go straight to the questions. Tell me, Bali, what are the goals of your company? Well, I think the long-term goals of the company is to, to grow on strength. You know, we, we came into the market, you know, at a very early stage, um, as you had just mentioned, in 2015 when the government had issued two licenses for research and development, one to the University of West Indies, one to the University of Technology. We operated with the University of Technology exclusively and you know, over a three-year period, while we're writing the um, legislation, getting everything passed and kind of stabilizing genetics, we got to train in terms of what growing standards are, indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, stabilization of genetics, training of software of seed to sale. You know, coming from that, you know, I would think the goal of Kyo is to strengthen our position across Jamaica. You know, so far we opened up in Ochi as our flagship location. Then we went to Falmouth you know, in front of the cruise ship pair and then in Kingston last year. We're gonna, we continue that trend with our partners in Negril and in, you know, in the different ports, but our, la our flagship locations will continue in Montego Bay and Port Antonio and Portmore in, in the coming months. And that was our strength. I don't know if you've seen and followed you know, quite a bit, but a lot of countries in the Caribbean are following the rules and regulations that Jamaica passed. So uh, Barbados issued last month their draft regulations, St. Vincent passed their regulations, you're seeing St. Lucia pass it, um, Bahamas is coming up. So I think with the strength that Kaya has a brand, we're going to see a regional um, outlay coming, you know, coming on stream between next year and the year after. And that you're going to see, we announced um, this weekend that we're doing our first franchise into Uruguay. Excellent. So, Excellent. So speaking of the Caribbean, I know at the start of the year, the company was looking to expand its dispensary chain by exporting to Barbados, St. Vincent's, Trinidad, and the wider Caribbean. Are those plans still on track? How is that going? Yeah, I mean, it's sad that the, um, the onset of the pandemic hit at that time because we had the first commercial export of cannabis extracts to Cayman and, you know, in February, then leading into it, and then, the, you know, Cayman was shut down in March. So going there, but one thing that was very interesting in Cayman is that we were only allowed at the time to 
um, export cannabis you know, oil. The rules changed because there was a lawsuit saying that wouldn't be allowing CO2. CO2 is how you vape, mm -hmm. and then you have different parts of the plant which are resin. So Cayman's law is everything but flower. So what we can see now after this is over, and we think December or Q1 next year, you're going to see a larger export to Cayman, but in a, in a much more diverse form. So you're going to see vape pens, this, that. And the greatest thing about it is that it's not stores. It's distributed through pharmacies mm. and directly to the hospitals, which, you know, you, you're getting right to the finish line and you're getting directly to the patients. So it's a different model than you see here. Great. So I, you may have mentioned it, but just repeat that again. So the demand for the cannabis oils exported to Cayman, that was certainly doing much well better this year. How, how is that going now? Yeah, it's doing well. Um, you know, it, it's, it's slightly slow because it's for the local market because they've had no tourists since March. Right, so Cayman has been totally shut out from anything else, but there is a light local market and you can get it from any pharmacy. Right. But you know, until they kind of open their borders, you're not gonna see the turnaround of what you're expecting and you know, like what we wanna see. Right. But once that opens up, I think you're gonna see a dramatic increase in sales in Cayman. Great. Uh, Gary uh, or Chris, either of you have a question you'd like to ask Valley? Sure, um, I can lead off. Um, so. As it states at the start, you know, Bali, you're chairman of the Kaya group. Could you explain to us what's in the group? Right. So, you know, as the laws were being drafted, you know, like it was an ongoing basis of what was going to happen. So to be vertically integrated, vertically integrated means that you control every single part of the plant. So you start with cultivation. So you have Kaya farms, then you have Kaya extracts to process in, and then Kaya herbouses. The difference between a herbos and a dispensary is that you have consumption on premise, right? And then you have, what we did was we, we developed underneath the group a non-medicinal area. So we have a pizzeria, we have a bar, we have a cafe, coffee shop, venues. So each of our you know, locations can hold 1,000 to 1,500 people. So the group kind of consists of, you know, the medicinal and non-medicinal arms balancing out each. And, you know, just looking at the offset of this pandemic, you'd have seen that the takeout of food and the herb house did really well, while the coffee house and the bars would have had to be in closed. Great. I know, at the, I know at the start of the year, you had plans for seven locations, and then we heard talks about you looking to expand by adding another four locations. Uh, how's that been going? Yeah, no, it's been, it's, it's been really well. I mean, dur dur during this year, we still continue with our growth strategy. So um, in the last two months, you know, we worked with Hedo Wido, which is at the Hedonism Hotel in the Grill. Mm -hmm. So we work with, you know, we work with Kevin and his team. So we're kind of the back end to support them. And that's the first dispensary built into a hotel. So that location opened up. We plan on opening our, um, our next flagship location in, in Montego Bay in Q1 of 2021. And, you know, depending on, you know, on time and stuff like that, and if the borders open up, we could see it opening in the end of this year depending on the time frame, but definitely moving towards Montego Bay and Portmore next year. And we have our second location in Uruguay opening in January of next year. So this year, first one, December 19th, next year, end of January in Uruguay. Excellent. Chairman, any questions from you? Yes, I have a simple question here, buddy. Um, okay. How many countries are you in now? And what's your projection? And when I say in, I mean physical locations. Right. At, um, well, How many you plan to be in? Right, so physical location. Is tourism start back up in June next year. Like, what, what's your projections for over the next two years? Yeah, over the, what, what we did was we kind of looked at the model based on elections and regulations across the Caribbean. So we see seven countries across the Caribbean in the next two years are going to either decriminalize, either for medical or recreational purposes. So we see that our presence would go there either directly, which means that we would build it out ourselves and, and, and we're not sure if we're going to be allowed to export from Jamaica, like for example, the flour and the extracts to Barbados, or if we're going to have to cultivate in Barbados. There's no clarity on that. If we can, I would say that we'd be owning our locations in Barbados. If not, I think we'd look for a strong local partner similar to ourselves to operate in these countries. But going back to your question, I would say that we'd be in seven countries over the next two years. Um, by the end of this year, we'd be operating in two countries, which is Jamaica and Uruguay, and we're operating in Cayman through our partners, Blue Water Medical. Okay, uh, as a follow-on question now, so um, based on what you're seeing, I mean, it's early in the whole industry and all of that, but what percentage of your business would you say is, and I'm losing, using these terms very, very loosely, what percentage is recreational and what percentage is medical? Um, well, it's 100% medical. 
right? So there, there, there is no recreational part of it. The recreation, um, Jamaica doesn't fall under that, that criteria. So we're a 100% medical market and you have to qualify to be a patient. So the, the only recreational side that you could say it's not, would, would not be inside the, the, the marijuana space, but it would, in terms of the bar, the cafe, or the events, you know, that could be, but if you're talking about a medical marijuana, it's a 100% medical product. Great. So tell me, um, Bali, do you guys have ambitions of going public? There's been a lot of talk about Yeah, that. you know, I mean, you know, it was on the join board very early, you know, and, you know, we've, we've spoken to, you know, a few banks and we had a shell. So we were going to do an RTO um, last year with um, Buzz Capital. And, you know, very close to the finish line, you know, we were looking at the market all the bigger Caribbean species, which we call LPs, mm -hmm. licensed producers in Canada, the canopy growth, Afri, Aurora, and stuff like that, were starting to double, triple digits, and stuff like that. And the, the, the valuations were, you know, canopy had raised four billion US. You're looking at, you know, like a twenty-four billion dollar, you know, you know, company, and you're looking at these companies growing really big. So it looked like, why would I try and go public by myself if they're operating in thirteen countries already, and I could get my brand into thirteen countries? So that the idea was, say, why why not look into partner with one of the bigger LPs? So we had shifted our, you know, our goal of going public and said, let's look what the LP model looks like and kind of look at, you know, of, of the growth strategy so we could grow quicker rather than sitting there trying to raise money, going on the public and, you're, you know, going public at the end of the day, you know, as any other public company, you're, you know, you're bound as a treadmill to the next quarter, right? So your long-term growth, you have to really be focused on stuff like that if you don't have your plan and your team together. It's going to be a tough journey. Right. It's already tough to operate in Jamaica, but I think based on just the elections that just transpired in the U.S., you have four states that have just gone recreational. I think you're going to see banking, you know, like federally, you know, approved next year, and you're going to see a much bigger opportunity for companies that are like us that are positioned, you know, doing the, doing the necessary work to have audited statements for three years. You know, you've worked at JPS, you know what that means qualifying for any transaction for a merger and acquisition or a public transaction, we're ready on both sides. So, you know, I, you know I'm going to watch how the, you know, the next few weeks you know, play out, but I think that we're generally going to look to see what a dual listing looks like between Canada and Jamaica. And if not, what is, the, what is that partnership looking like in the U.S. now that it be a federal thing and how do we partner to grow the band the quickest to get out there? Yeah, and without talking U.S. politics, I would imagine the, the, the current uh, decision should favor a little bit more, it seems to me. Well, like I mean, if you saw the vice president's elections, I mean, she openly said that she's completely for it. She's going to sponge all records and medically across the board, she's going to be in full support of it. Right now, it's just Biden to take that lead now and kind of lead it. But what you're seeing is that you're going to see a full movement into it. I mean, you saw total legalizations in Oregon. Um, I definitely think there's going to be a huge push. And if you just look on the public companies, every public company since the election has gone up over 20 to 30 percent in the last week. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty surprising. Uh, Chairman Gary, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I, I actually thought the market was going to crash, but it seems like it's, it's doing pretty good. I certainly think there's great prospects for, for you guys for next year based on the whole corresponding banking issues and how that looks, looks like that's playing out. Chairman, Gary, any comments? Bali, yep. Chris, um, tell me, um, what do you think the size of the recreational market in Jamaica would be in a normal Jamaica and is that something that the government should be looking on or that's not good for the industry and why and, and so forth and so on? Um, I, my, my general feeling is that I think it would be stronger in the long term that it's a recreational market because you're giving access to people. You know, and I could, you know, I could paint an example if you're, if, you're a, if you're a chairman or a CEO of a public company, would you want to have on your file a medical thing that you're going to purchase this on your record, right? So the difference between medical and recreation, like in Denvo, is that you present your ID, you're above the age of 21, but no record is kept of what you're purchasing and that's not kept as something that will hold you back later on in life. Right. So if you're a pilot, you couldn't have a medical card or you couldn't qualify. So, but I still think regulation is going to be a pillow and what the Cannabis License Authority is doing and stuff like that, even if it moves towards recreational, still should be governed by the regulations of it and it should be tightened because it's, you can't have a free for all because if you go recreational totally without regulation, what you're going to see is that we're going to continue the drugs for ganja, you're going to see that continuation and the normalcy of the business that we're trying to achieve that everybody is growing from, the, the farmers going all the way up to the business people 
wouldn't really happen if it's just a loose economy, because why would you join it if you can just do it on the black market? So there has to be a difference between the black market and a recreational market you know, based on regulation. But I think in the long term, we should look at what a recreational market looks like. I think any of the valuations or any of the revenues that I'm doing now, I would, I would go five to tenfold of what I was doing if it was recreational. Excellent. Uh, uh, for you guys out there on social media. That, that's a big number. That's a big number. And uh, we also have to think about that we will be competing against many other countries which are going recreational immediately. So um, I'm just trying to think big picture here. Yeah, I, I, well, at the end of the day, you're going to have to have a quality product, right? The reason we, our product, where we can compete, for example, in the coffee market is that Jamaica Blue Mountain Coffee is a specialty car and we can compete in the coffee market. So if you take, for example, and you go to a dispensary in Canada or you go in Denver or something, and Jamaica has a brand of special strains grown well and sent from here, I think on the market you could see these Jamaican strains on anywhere in a recreational market, and that's how you export because you're not trying to take over their market. What you're trying to do is have a piece of their market because the brand itself carries that way. I'd like to have that same feeling when I went to Jamaica, I got married and I had this feeling. I can't get it in the U.S. It's too strong. It's grown indoor. I want that Jamaican stuff. And Jamaica carries a brand. We're one of the meccas. We're one of the five countries in the world that there is substance that weed is part of, of everything that's done in the country. I mean, and there's not one site. There's not one construction site. There's nothing built in the whole of Jamaica, and it's been around, you know, since it started. So, you know, I see it as a, a normal thing that has to transcend and kind of move, but it has to be a part of what we're doing here because if it's not, then we're going to lose the whole thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree with that, Bali, because, you know, it's, it's, if we think back to the old days and the alcohol market, I mean, this whole thing doesn't work unless the government gets their take, so definitely has to be regulated and controlled. Um, but to me, um, regulation and control doesn't mean that we don't have the recreational market, because I think that market's going to be um, huge. You know, it's, it's a huge market to itself. And the medical market... Um, is, is, is also going to be huge, but there, the research and development is, is just starting. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done medical, whereas recreation is like, hey, that's ready right now. We can go with that. Yeah. No, and, and, and we're only covering about maybe 65% of what we could actually do in the market right now. So in Jamaica, we're allowed to do every single part of the product except for edibles at the moment because when the legislation was drafted, they had taken it out for a variety of reasons. It could get into the hands of kids. It wasn't regulated. They didn't have enough information. But in any other dispensary, if you think you have a small kid or a young kid, you can't get him to smoke a spliff. You're not going to do it. You're going to have to find an ingestible, some type of oil, and you're going to have to do it. And we're going to have to work together to have that part of the market because if Jamaica is going to have something that's special and we're going to have IP, mm -hmm. as a Jamaica IP and a formulation and a patent, and we're going to bring it back down, it's not going to be in the flow of the smoke that everybody thinks the market is. It's going to be in a formulation that's a guaranteed tested product that can be delivered over and over again. And that's where the value is going to be. It's, those are the real values mm -hmm. when you come up with a pharmaceutical product that could be exported anywhere in the world. And you start getting other companies being able to touch it and, you know, banking has been a touchy subject, but you look at Carreras, how could Carreras not be wanting to look at it, even in a CBD product of saying what it looks like? You know, you know, you saw Lasco kind of slightly touch on it that they wanted to invest in it, but, you know, when is the difference of when, when is Wisinka going to take a look at it? You know, when is Jamaica producers going to convert some of that banana and that stuff that's not working out too well and say, no, we're going to convert to CBD? We don't know, but they're not going to touch any of these things till they see a regulated normal market with normal business practices and banking and everything that they can not affect the loans that they have on their books. Absolutely. That correspondent banking issue also has to be resolved. Uh, for those of you out there in social media. Banking here, Mali. Banking. Tell us about banking. What's really going on there? Have we made any progress or are we still in no man's land? Uh, it's, I mean, you know, I think, I think uh, Minister Shaw was definitely, the, you know, like a good person last, you know, you know, kind of chairing it, you know, and, you know, coming from Ministry of Finance, coming into Ministry of Agriculture, he understood what it was, but there's no way any bank in Jamaica could touch it because the basis is your correspondent bank. So I agree with every bank of saying, no, I'm not going to touch anything to do with that if they're dealing with deposits and stuff of touching of the actual product. There's no way that any bank would touch it. But I think the minute 
the first bank in the U.S. or any law start to change in the U.S. Naturally, you, the, Jamaica is the first place dying to open their books. You know, like, you know, Scotia, being operated in Canada, has most of the bigger marijuana corporations operating in Canada, but they can't operate in Jamaica, the jurisdiction, because it's not recreational like Canada. So just like that, they don't have the ability to bank. The same companies that they bank in Canada cannot bank in Jamaica, the same bank. So I think the possibility of a, a you know, a, a corporate union, you know, like a co-op or something like that starting in Jamaican dollars, where farmers and everybody could get their money together might be the starting point. If not, we just have to watch in the first quarter and see what happens when, you know, when Biden and you know, Kamala come in and see what they're going to actually do. Because I think they could make an early move. And I think, we, you know, I think we're seeing the trend that the move is going to happen quicker than we think. Yeah, I think, I think this issue clearly has to be uh, adjust, uh, addressed. Uh, for those of you out there in social media, please feel free to send in uh, any questions you may have. The, the first one I've gotten is uh, a question about private equity. Uh, this person's asking Balia, uh, would you guys consider doing a private equity deal before you go public? So obviously you're... Yeah, no, no. Debt, I mean, I mean you, you, you always have to look at what the ratio is. I mean, I mean and sometimes you, you want to have debt, you know, on that thing. You know, so private equity, you know, looking at doing a smaller raise, or a discounted raise at 20% of what you're going to go out at, I mean, that, you know, that, that definitely could be looked at, you know, like, so, you know, if you're going to go out and raise $5 million and you pick up one to $2 million early because you want to continue the growth, definitely, you know, worth looking at. But, you know, I think convertible debt, you know, right now and giving somebody interest on their money in the long term probably is better where they have the option to one, earn interest guaranteed. They don't have to know too much of business because they can understand what I know is. And if they like it, they can convert it if you're going to go public or you're going to do something more exciting. Yep, sounds like a great idea. Gary, any thoughts from your questions? Uh, yeah, um, you know, so unfortunately, Bali COVID kind of slowed the plans. But my question is, um, where are you now? Um, is, is the business still operational? Uh, I mean, most, most businesses have shut down. I mean, what has been your experience? You know, it was, a, it was a very, very tough time towards the end of February to make that decision. And, you know, we, we took a board decision and we said, and, you know, I kind of pushed the mandate. I said, I think it's in our full interest that we stay open. One, I think, you know, I, I felt like it was an entitlement from the first day. I got our license to continue to sell. And we've never closed our door Monday to Sunday, you know, from 2018. We've never closed on any holiday, any election, nothing. We've maintained open. We had a big drop off that, you know, in April of 80%. You know, you're dropping off 80% of the revenues. You see no tourists. But what you saw, if you're fighting through the April, you, you've recovered from 60 to 40 to 35 percent of those same numbers and you're operating a total local market because we only had tours coming back in July 1st. So what we've learned to do is adapt, cut all your costs that you need to do. Your, your, staff, your staff contingent had to come down but you've got a better bearing on it and you're operating in a full local market so you're, it's, it's, a, it's a much different change of having different things more fresh on those shelves. You're not looking at the type of t-shirts and novelties that would be gift ideas, you're looking at the real things. And if your average spend was $50 US before, you're going to see your average spend of $25 now, but you're going to see a higher frequency because that person can come in more often than the first time. So it's just a different market that we're getting used to right now. But I think it's made it tough for us. So when we do see this tour starting to come back in December and January and lead into Q3, Q4 next year, I think would be absolutely fine. Well, that's an amazing story, Bali, because... If you're able to survive in one of the worst times, then, I mean, the upside is going to be tremendous. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, the, I think the, the biggest problem is, and I'm sure you guys had to do it also, but the times of the curfew. No matter what it is, if you ask me, you know, like, if a curfew is 9 p.m., even if you're allowed to stay open to 9, in realistically, how could you get your staff home? How could you do this stuff? So we're, at any time the curfew changes, we close one hour before the curfew. And the multiple changes from 3 p.m., 6 p.m., and now 9 p.m., in realistically 8 p.m., the time you beat traffic, you're really not having any time on anything. So I think just moving from 9 to 11 people is going, 9 to 11 p.m. is going to change a drastic landscape, not only of like Kaya, but KFC, anywhere else, of like the normal business that you need to operate. Yeah, we've operate, had, we've had you know? other guests on say the exact same So, thing. Gary, if the, if, if the curfews move to a realistic time, that alone will strengthen the business, and then you move into where the curfews hopefully will disappear in Christmas. You know, we get this thing under control. But, you know, if not, and we have to operate under these, I think we'll be fine, but we just need hours of operation of business to change for all business to operate and last to get through this. Great. Excellent. I have another question coming in from social media folks. Uh, they're asking 
Um, is there any uh, connection between the medical benefits of marijuana and COVID specifically? Uh, there, there, are, there, are, there have been a few studies by a few companies. Dr. Annabelle, um, who works on Macy CBD, which is also married to Gramps Morgan and Morgan Heritage, has been working on clinical trials with the White House during the COVID, so there are people like doing it. I haven't seen any tests or proof to, you know, to say that it is, but you know, what it does is it strengthens your immune system from the CBD side, not the THC side. And anything that you can do to strengthen your immune system, I think you should, anybody should do right now. Yeah, I, I guess that social media question was hoping that we could see the uh, marijuana being used as a base for vaccines or something. Um, has there been any changes to Kaya's medical screening process um, that's required before people make purchases? Yeah, well, in, in Jamaica, you have to have a recommendation by a doctor. That's, that's part of the regulation. So, you know, um, for the days that we don't have a doctor on site, we, we utilize telemedicine. And that's been a learning curve through the whole pandemic. And, you know, a lot of people have gotten more used to it. So your screening test is that you'd, one, you'd have to qualify your data. You submit all your application. You log into, you know, so we use MD link. They would have logged into the stuff. They have a variety of doctors to choose which are available on that day. You go through the screening process. If the screening process is covered with the doctor, the doctor, just like if you were getting something to go to Fontana Pharmacy, we get the recommendation emailed directly, logged into a valid, to make it a valid patient, and then we take the person through the screen process. If the person was denied, then they can't come in. Oh, excellent. That's good to know. Good. Chairman, Gary, any, any further questions from you? Okay, question number nine. The company provides innovative holistic health and wellness solutions. Has there been an increase in sales related to consumers taking preventative measures against the virus? No, I, I, I think um, more than preventive measures against the virus, I think a lot of people have had time to kind of have time to themselves. You know, I think people have had the time like where I would have seen somebody trying three different genetics and saying, look, I like this and this is where it is. I've seen people expand their horizon and trying up to 15 different ones and that. really get into it and really kind of going across the board because they've had time to themselves, they're staying at home. You know, it's, you know, people never had the luxury of this time on their hands before. So what we're seeing is a higher frequency of use and a broader variety. So if you were only using flour before, you're going to try hash, you're going to try resin, you're going to try rosin, and you're going to try vaping across the board, and you're going to see what you like. So I've seen, a, I've seen people trying more and trying to find out what they like because they've had time on their hand to, to dial into their self. Right, right, right. And another question in from social media, why Uruguay? Well, Uruguay is one of the hottest cities in South America. I mean, anybody that knows Punta del Este, Punta del Este is like San Tropez, it's like Ibiza, it's like Cannes, it's like the Hamptons. It's got the largest spend per capita, you know, in the Christmas and the winter season. So it was natural that it was legal there from 2000, you know, you know, 13. So why wouldn't you want to do it? And it fits the same demographic of lifestyle. Kaya has a good part of a lifestyle part of our brand that extends that part. And we thought it was a perfect fit. We think, we think South America fits in with the Caribbean and LATAM strategy. Great. The questions are rolling in. Here's somebody asking about the uh, correspondent banking issue, and they're wondering why the Canadian banks like BNS or CIBC can't lend support. Uh, Be because we haven't, we haven't created a full recreational framework, and we don't have the supporting systems to back up exactly what they have there. So until we have the same, until we have the same it, it would be easier for us to work with Canada than the U.S. to start the process. I mean, you have to dumb it down. It's illegal in Jamaica if Correct. it's not medical. Correct. That's, that's it. Banks, banks can't deal in illegal stuff. Right. Doesn't work. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think they're curious about them doing the business in Canada but not doing it in Jamaica. And I think it's because of the correspondent banking relationships between Jamaica and the U.S. That's what's creating the problem, yeah. No, but BNS has marijuana companies in Canada. Correct, in Canada. But but the, but it's not the BNS Jamaica in Jamaica. Right. No 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 no. You're not following that. Help me out. In Canada, you have a rec. It's not. It's legal in Canada. It's uh, recreation and medical. Understood. 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 So so the Canadian banks can do business there with companies because it's legal. The same Canadian bank cannot do it in Jamaica because it's not legal because we don't have a regulatory framework for it here. So that's the reason it's not, it, so cor corresponding banking 
is not the main reason. The main reason is because it's not legal. So, but you know, it's probably the right, the right thing you're saying though, because for some odd reason, if the US doesn't go in that direction, it makes sense for Jamaica to look at the recreational market just to fix the banking. You know? But I, 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 I feel quite positive about the US, thanks, sir. Great, one more question coming in. Um, who, who is Kaya's target consumer? ideal consumer? Is it a local person or a tourist? And also, how do locals um, purchase uh, and, and what are the projected rates, the fact that the black market for cannabis is so large? I, I, I guess they're just trying to understand, I mean, it's, it's, can you market the locals yeah, versus tourists? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think it's a mix, I think it's a mixed question, but I think what they're trying to say, one, Kaya, Kaya's demographic is, is anybody that qualifies to get a fine product. So, I mean, if you're, a, if you're a taxi man all the way to a billionaire or whatever it is, we don't, you know, we don't separate that. And I think kind of fits that whole demographic that everybody feels at home there, right? To qualify, the most important thing, there are four ways to qualify. So if you're a tourist coming into the island, then you'd have to qualify. Do you have your medical card from that state or country? Do you have a rec making recommendation and for, or a prescription from a doctor abroad? That would correlate to a local doctor here. If you're a local person or a Jamaican, then you have to either see your doctor in person and break a recommendation from that doctor or you'd have to go into one of the telemeds and visit something but unless you qualify with an official recommendation from a doctor you can't go to any medical marijuana dispensary in Jamaica. Understood. And one more question coming in from social media. Uh, could you name uh, two or three things that the regulators could do to make the startup of the business easier here in Jamaica? Um, I think uh, I think an online tracking system, like you know, if you submit to the application and you could watch it online and you could say, okay, I've checked here, I've reached there, I've done this, okay, stop, fill these papers, and it kind of takes you through that process where it's not, you are not stuck in um, at a certain point. You know, part of the regulation is that do you own the land? Most f farmers that want to get into the business don't own the land. So how are they going to get a title? How are they going to get a lease of it? How are they going to get a property taxes? So they're at a roadblock in that segment. So if the CLA saw that and you could analyze that problem, person is having a problem or those farmers are generally having a problem, you could fix that problem. So I think an online tracking system wouldn't be a bad idea, you know, one, for getting it into it. I think, you know, you know, working towards regulation of getting the Bank of Jamaica, which we did last year, and we had a Senate which all of the stakeholders met with the Bank of Jamaica to set up a co-op or get some kind of banking framework in place, even if it's in Jamaican dollars, not U.S., right. just to get a framework in place that you can move money around between it because these transactions, you know, a lot of these transactions are in cash. That yeah, makes sense. Last question for me. I, 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 a lot of people don't realize you, you actually do the farming as well. So how, how did the weather affect you? Uh, the last 10 days hasn't been great. I mean, you know, luckily we're, we're, we're covered by greenhouses, but I mean, having 10 days, no sunshine, you know, you're having a different variety of problems, but you know, just like anything else, you have to use the better days, like the three days to recover what you do and stuff like that. But um, definitely a tough thing. And luckily our farm is positioned you know, in a good position. We weren't in a, a bad area that would have flooded the roads would have left us or anything like that. So luckily we were okay, but you know, I'm sure some other people got hurt. Yeah, and I think the greenhouse farming is a great idea. It's Sorry, so general direction not. we need to move in. Gary, um, yep, Gary. Buddy, are you able to supply other people the products from your farm? Yeah, so cur currently we have you know, a few third-party vendors that we supply our, our genetics and our stuff to. So they, they stay completely out of it. They stay only in the retail. Like, Hedo Weeda is not in, the, not in the cultivation side, and they might go into the future, but they're not in it. You know, Dr. Robinson and a few other parties like that don't do it. They're strictly into retail. So we supply our stores plus, um, plus Cayman and these other third-party vendors that we have, or B2B as we call it. Great. Thanks, Bali. That was very, 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 very informative for me and for our listeners, I'm sure. Uh, at this point in time, we'd like to do our top picks, which we typically do, and I usually ask either the chairman or the CEO or both uh, to give us their top pick of the week. So, Gary, uh, let's start with you. What's your top stock pick for this week? Well, my top pick for this week is Grace Kennedy. Um, they just put out some blockbuster results. Um, it's clear that they're making a lot of traction with their overseas subsidiaries. Um, on a trailing basis, I think the, the PE works out to just under 10. And based on the current growth rate, that PE is going to fall substantially. So I think that's the stock to buy right now. Um, full disclosure, um, MJE bought some shares this week. <laughs> you can't go wrong with a stock trading with a PE ratio of 10 times or lower. I think they're only 
three. That's trillion. Yeah, that's they're, trillion. they're, they're only forward. I agree, and there are probably only three companies on the stock market with a PE ten times or lower in the main market. Chris, what about you? What's your topic for this week? And you can't say Grace Kennedy. Okay. Um, my topic this week is go long Jamaican dollars. So I think uh, the Jamaican wow. dollar is going to have a big rally in December against the U.S. And um, if you have bills to pay, don't buy the U.S. right now. Wait a little longer. There's a Christmas present coming your way. You heard, you heard it here. I wow, that's a, that's a, that's yeah. a big one. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> Bali, do you follow the stock market yeah, much? No, I mean, yeah. I mean, we have the same payables and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, like, you know, I, you know I, I feel quite confident and quite, you know, good that, you know, Chris would say that. So, you know, you know I'm looking forward, you know, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic on it. Just, you know, I see a lot of barn. I see a lot of pain in there that I don't think has come to the market yet. But I mean, you know, there is stimulus, there is some good stuff coming, but I'd be much happier if it comes down, but you know, I'm planning for both. Yeah, excellent. And for me, I, hey, I'm a big fan of Carreras, the, the stock, not the cigarette, but the stock, uh, because that's the second of three companies that I can think of that has a trailing PE of 10 times. They make $3 billion a year in their sleep, have a dividend yield that's over 9%. It's just a great performing stock. And I think that company um, next year, we're going to see some changes in the correspondent banking, and I'd, I'd be surprised if, like you said, we don't see careers moving over into this into Yeah, this I, I think you're going to see a lot of the... the they have the, a ton load of cash, for sure. Well, thanks, thanks, Bally. It was great having you, thanks, Chris. Uh, uh, Gary, thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it. To our viewers, thank you all for being a part of this month's virtual Investor Forum series. I'd also like to thank you, our special guest, Bali, for being with us today and giving us great insight onto Kaya Group. It was pretty interesting for me and for our viewers, I'm sure. And we're certainly looking forward to yet another Investor uh, Forum next week uh, when we'll have another special guest. So stay tuned in, guys, to hear who that special guest is. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for you guys who joined us on Instagram and other social media memes. But make sure you subscribe to the Mayberry YouTube channel. Thank you all for tuning in today. Please keep safe. And Gary, what do we always say? Like a Lord, witch, I listen, make my bird, my chalawa. It's meditation for the scholars and the warriors. I'm on that la la, I'm on that la la, I'm on that la la. <laughs> so give me the gush, cause I'm an urgent to bush. And best believe I need high grade for my aid. Give me the herbs and many different flavors. Telling you the truth is like a lifesaver. Oh, marijuana in my bloodstream. It's a hold my vibes up. Food for the brain, so it's a make we wise up. Got rids under fire, so why it's a make we rise up. I just spit them, you know, my next one up.